right, good morning, everybody. I was so busy shooting that video, I almost forgot to turn my microphone on. So, uh, hey, uh, we, today we are finishing uh, our series called Crosswalk. Anybody enjoyed this journey through the cross uh, for these last few weeks? I, I hope you have. I hope it's changed your life. I hope it's challenged you. I hope it's encouraged you to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We're going to jump into this last message here in a moment, but as you all know by now, next week is Easter, and I'm going to ask you to do two things. First of all, I'm going to ask you to bring people with you, and join me and Tracy. Bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your coworkers, people who don't know the Lord, people who are not connected to a church. Easter is a time for a fresh start, all right? I can't tell you how many, how many testimonies are in this church of people who began their relationship with, son, with, with the Lord because of Easter Sunday. Matter of fact, can I get the hands of people? Easter is when you gave your heart to the Lord. All right, give it up for all these people. It's a great time to invite people to church. So I encourage you to do that. So this Tuesday, would you join me in fasting one meal, just one, this Tuesday, and when you're fasting that meal, I want you to take time to pray for the Easter services, and pray for the people that you're going to invite. Because the Bible says it's not by our might or by our power, but it's by His Spirit. We want God's Spirit to work in people's lives. How, how many know what I'm talking about? So want, join me this Tuesday uh, by prayer and fasting. Just one meal. You won't die, I promise, and it'll be good. So I encourage you to do that. Now, remember, after Easter, we're going to start a series through the Song of Solomon, and it's going to be called Red Hot. Yeah, <laughs> and we're going to talk about love and relationships and sex and marriage and conflict. Red hot. It's going to be good. And so uh, I'm looking forward uh, to that here today. Let's, let's go to our theme verse for this series. Jesus told his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake We'll find it. Now, just real quick, let me, let me, let me remind you that, that what Jesus is saying, that this is, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian. It takes more than just believing in Jesus. We have to take on a mindset. And the mindset is that we filter everything through the cross. Everything. Now, we've only taken five messages, and we've talked about a lot of things, but we could take 20. This could be a year-long series and just talk about everything filtered through the cross. My job through the filter of the cross. My future through the filter of the cross. But let's just recap. We talked about the cross in me and that everything that I surrender to God is blessed. When God asks me to lay my life down, he's not taking it from me. He's trying to get something to me. Come on, somebody. And then the cross in marriage, every marriage that is alive has got a lot of death in it. I love saying that every single time. The cross in relationships, the cro last week was the cross and suffering, and today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, sin. Somebody just said, can we skip that one? The word sin is used 786 times in the Bible. So we can't skip it. It's right there. The Bible talks a lot about sin. The Bible is a book about sin. Now, when it comes to sin, usually in American Christianity, we go to one of two extremes. The one extreme is everything is sin, and everybody's a sinner. Matter of fact, all church should be about you filthy sinners coming down to the altar and get right with God. All right, and we get judgmental and and we get critical and legalistic, and everybody's a sinner. Now, that's one extreme. The other extreme is grace, 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 grace. It's all grace, you know. You do whatever you need to do because of grace, you know. Uh, you know, I'm not under the law. Uh, I, I'm under grace, so I can live any way that, that I want to. How many know those are both the wrong view of sin? If we're going to have the right attitude about sin, we have to look through the lens of the cross. So this morning, I want to invite you to take a fresh look at what sin is so that we can have an appreciation for the cross. As we head into Holy Week, we come into Good Friday. This is, this is really a Good Friday message, by the way. Uh, in order for us to truly understand Easter and the resurrection, we have to 
take some time to look at sin and, and the cross. And in order to have a balanced view, I love this quote from Tim, Tim Keller. He puts it this way. Through the cross, we see that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dare believed. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. I want to leave that up for a second because this is powerful. Through the cross, we realize that we're more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. So it's not either or, it's, it's both. So how do we sin, see sin in the light of the cross? I want you to take notes. We're going to go pretty quickly. First of all, through the cross, we recognize that sin is deadly. Sin is deadly. It's okay if you don't amen me on, on this first part, okay? Uh, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And in James chapter 1, it says, when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. See, uh, Jesus walked on the earth for 33 years, and he did a lot of miracles, and he taught a lot of good things, but that is not why he came. He came to die. He came to experience death, and the reason is because of sin. He died for sin, and sin brings death. Now, those of us who have lost a loved one to cancer know how deadly cancer is. And I think most of us have at least experienced a family member or a loved one that has died as a result of cancer. Now, let me be clear. Cancer is not sin. That is not what I'm saying. But I think sin is a lot like cancer because it may start very small. And if it's allowed to grow and grow and grow, it will eventually kill you. Let me just go ahead and say we're heading into prom season, students. We, we've, we've, and I don't want to scare you and I don't want to be morbid, but we've all been to too many funerals of kids who made dumb mistakes in seasons like this, and they think it's not going to harm anybody. I'm just going to live a little. Sin is deadly. Don't mess with it. Through the cross, we see that. Secondly, we see that sin is serious. Sin's not a game. It's not something to be played with. Now, in our culture, we don't like to call sin, sin. We like to use words like, oh, I made a mistake, or I messed up, or I'm just progressive. I'm a modern man, a, a modern woman, or I'm just a product of my environment. But the Bible doesn't use those words to describe sin. The Bible uses words like transgressions, and iniquity, and trespasses. A little harder than the words that we like, that we like to use. This past week, I was, I was in Washington, D.C., and I had the opportunity to attend the, uh, vi the Bible study that takes place in the office of the Vice President of the United States. And you say, Pastor, how do you, how do you get to be part of these things? I have one word for you, Jeff Cardwell. <laughs> I was a guest of Jeff, you know. And so uh, I had the privilege of, of opening that in prayer. By the way, the vice president was not there. I had the privilege of opening in prayer. And after I pray and sit down, the pastor who's leading the Bible study says, okay, now let's open your Bibles to Matthew 18. And my phone rings. I just wanted to share that with you. Turn your phone off but when you're in the vice president's Bible study. That's just totally free. Okay, and so the reason I'm telling you this story, because he goes to Matthew chapter 18. Let's read the verse that we studied there in the vice president's office. He said, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. This is another one of those big gulp sermon, uh, message, verses. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, you say, uh, I know uh, a lot of people say people have wrestled with this passage ever since it was written. Was Jesus being literal? Was he being symbolic? Or was he just using hyperbole? You know, you can wrestle with that all of you want, but the reality is there is no doubt that Jesus is saying that sin is serious and that we should take sin seriously. Why is that? Because, write this down, sin killed Jesus. Sin 
is what killed Jesus. In Romans, Paul says he was delivered over to death because of our trespasses, our sin. The Bible says he became the curse of sin for us. The reason that he died was because of sin. And I was praying about this a few weeks ago. And as I was praying through this message and, and through this, you know, God, God spoke to me a couple things. Because sin killed Jesus, sin is personal to God. Sin is, sin is very personal to God. It's hard for us to imagine, but what if somebody intentionally hurt your child? What if somebody abducted your child, abused them, uh, uh, physically tortured them, and made them suffer so much that they eventually died? How would you feel about that person? Sin killed God's son. So sin is very personal. To God. And, and that means that sin is pain to God. Well, it's not a big deal. It actually is. It's personal to God. It's a big deal to God when we sin. See, and it gets worse because it wasn't just sin that killed Jesus. It's my sin that killed Jesus. This is what we understand through the cross. You remember in 2004, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, reignited an age-old question about who was responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Was it the Roman soldier who ran a spear into his side? Was it Pontius Pilate who authorized the crucifixion? Was it the Jewish religious leaders who incited the crowd? Was it the crowd itself? Was it Satan working behind the scenes? Each of these individuals and all played a part in the role of the death of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but were each, any of them fully responsible for his death? The Bible makes it clear who is responsible. In Isaiah 53, he says he was pierced for, can you say it? Our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. This punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Who was responsible for the death of Jesus? I was. You are. Today when you leave this service, every one of you is going to receive this nail. And I'm going to ask you to put it somewhere important. And it's going to remind you of a few things. First thing it's going to remind you of is that it's going to remind you that your sin killed Jesus. I was responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. See, now here's the deal. In our culture, and this is what we're going to fight next weekend as people come to church on Easter. The, the reason that people think they're going to heaven is because they think they're a good person. I'm a good guy. I haven't hurt anybody. I, I don't do this. I don't do that. Listen, the, the Bible says we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has gone to his own way. There is none that is good. Are you getting this? And so when you keep this hand, I, I keep the, when, you, when you get this nail, I want you to keep it in a, an important place as a reminder. Because I know, I know it's hard to do, and, and we don't want to do it. But in order for us to fully understand the gospel, we've got to take time and stare at the cross. This cross is sanded and smooth. It's well lit. It's, it's kind of nice. But I'm talking about the cross that's ugly and bloody, and stained with the blood of Jesus Christ. we got to take some time and, and look at that and, and recognize this is because of me. It was my lying and my adultery, my pride, my anger, my self-righteousness, my gossip that's responsible for that. It was me. I did that. It wasn't the Roman soldier. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't even the devil. I should have died. I should have been crucified. And the penalty of death that Jesus received, it was mine to pay. You might remember the director of The Passion of the Christ played a cameo in the movie. Instead of having an actor be the one who put the nail into the palm of Jesus during the crucifixion scene, the director did it himself. 
And when they shot the scene of the nail being placed in Christ's hand, he wanted to be the one who was holding the nail. And according to the movie's website, he said the gesture is symbolic of the fact that that he holds himself accountable first and foremost for Christ's death. Here's what he said. He said, it was me that put him on the cross. It was my sins that put him there. In our modern culture, we like to rush through this part of the gospel. We don't like to spend a lot of time here. We want to go straight to the good news. But if we don't take some time and let this sink in about our guilt, our responsibility, our hopelessness, we actually rob the gospel of its power. Because when I see sin through the filter of the cross, then grace truly becomes amazing. The story then becomes incredibly personal. And we begin to realize why missionaries will go to the farthest corners of the earth and suffer. And some of them will die for the sake of the greatest story ever told. It's why people who were once hardened and and calloused and far from God, when they behold the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, they turn and, and their hearts are changed and their lives are changed and they're filled with gratitude and joy. The movie, The Passion of the Christ, remember, takes great measures to authentically display the suffering that Jesus experienced as a result of our sin. And the suffering became a reality to many on the set as the movie is being produced. You may remember during the scourging scene, the actor who played Jesus was accidentally whipped, knocking the wind out of him. It didn't just happen once, but the second time he was accidentally whipped, it hurt him so much that it caused him to wrench his hand from the metal shackles that were surrounding him, and it left a permanent scar. After the second time, the actors accidentally whipped, uh, the actors playing the Roman soldiers accidentally whipped uh, the actor playing Jesus. Then they put just sticks in their hands and they just motioned it out. I mean, that, that would hurt. The scene of the crucifixion was, sought, was shot in Italy during the dead of winter. And... Jim Caviezel, who played Jesus, suffered hypothermia. Famously, you may have heard that while filming the crucifixion, the actor was struck by lightning. And this is not from some Christian website. This is from IMDb, Internet Movie Database, who says that witnesses saw lightning coming out of his ears and that his hair was frizzy afterwards. But the actor was not harmed. And again, this is from IMDb. It says, because of their experiences during film production, many of the cast and filming crew converted to Christianity after completion of the film. Among those who was converted was the atheist who played Judas Iscariot. You see, when we actually take time to behold the cross, it does something to us. We want to sanitize it. We want to clean it up. We don't like to see the pictures. We don't want to think about it. We'll have small crowds on Good Friday. We'll blow the doors open on Easter. We just don't like this part. But when we view sin through the cross, I like what Charles Spurgeon said, too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of the Savior. Billy Graham said it's not getting people saved that's the problem. It's getting people lost. I love what David Platt said. He said, the modern day gospel says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Therefore, follow these steps and you can be saved. Meanwhile, the biblical gospel says you're an enemy of God, dead in your sin, and in your present state of rebellion, you are not even able to see that you need life, much less to cause yourself to come to life. Therefore, you are radically dependent on God to do something in your life that you could never do. See, without the cross, I'm hopeless and helpless. I'm dead. I'm condemned. I I, I have no escape. So I'm really, really glad that the story of the cross doesn't stop there. Are you you ready today? Write this down. Because through the cross, you can have forgiveness of sin. All right? I, I talked to you about the hard part. Now let's talk about the good part right here. Through the cross, I can have forgiveness of sin. Now the Bible comes to life. Now the songs mean a little bit more. I love what Colossians says, you were dead 
I was dead because of my sin and because of my sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made me alive with Jesus. Why? Say it with me. For he forgave all our sins. Isn't that good news? He canceled. Everybody say cancel. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Somebody give God praise for the cross. There's an old song. I'm not going to sing it. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed somebody to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. I'm going to tell you what, with, without the first part of the cross, grace is not amazing. But when you stand before the cross and you behold your guilt, your condemnation, your helplessness, then grace is amazing. And this is really the heart of the message here today, and I want you to write this down, because through the cross, I can have victory over sin. Through the cross, you and I can have victory over sin. When Jesus, what Jesus did at the cross was do more than just pay the penalty for my sin, to forgive me of my sin, he provided us power over sin. Let me be very clear. If you understand what Jesus did at the cross, you know that you don't have to keep on sinning. The life that you live before Jesus is not the same life that you have to live after Jesus. I'll be honest with you. I cringe when I hear Christians say, well, you know, we're just sinners saved by grace. You know, we all sin every day. Now, listen, I know what people are trying to say. They're trying to say, I'm not perfect. And guess what? I'm not perfect either. But I'm trying to tell you, you got to stop seeing yourself the way the devil sees you. And you've got to stop acting the way the devil sees you as a sinner because God does not see you any longer as a sinner. He sees you through the eyes of this cross that you are a saint of the living God. I said, that's good news. Listen, Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, he said, he straightened her up and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And has no one condemned you? And no one, Lord, she answered. Watch this. I'm not condemning you either. That is great. Jesus is not here to condemn you. He's here to save you. But after he saves you, look what he says. Go and sin no more. And then he says to the guy who was healed at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, he says, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. Now listen, I know there's a lot of people in our culture. There are many Christians in our culture say it is impossible to stop sinning. And yet Jesus told two people to do it. If Jesus told people to stop sinning, then we can stop sinning. Okay, Pastor, now how does that work? How do we stop sinning? Well, it goes all the way back to the beginning of this series. If anybody wants to be my disciple, he has to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Remember, the cross is an instrument of death. He's inviting us to die. He's inviting us to lay our lives down and to surrender. And I love how Paul explains it in Romans chapter 6. I want you to lean in on this part of the message. This is really the meat of the message here today. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No stinking way. That's Wayne's translation. Should, should we, after we're saved, after we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, do I just go ahead and keep on sinning? No way. We are those who have, we've done what? We've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, those that are getting baptized today, I, I, I talked about this a few weeks ago. What it is is symbolic of your death to sin. The death to your old life. You are dead. That part of you is gone. It's dead. And now you're alive in Jesus Christ. You were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, why does he do that? Because just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now listen, grace, 
Uh, uh, one more verse, Romans, uh, uh, Romans 6, 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, let me stop right here, because a lot of people use that line, that last line, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, as an excuse to do whatever they want. But the context of this verse says, sin's no longer my master. I don't have to keep doing what I used to do. I don't have to keep talking like I used to talk. I don't have to keep acting the way I used to act because sin is no longer in charge of me. See, grace is not just the forgiveness of sin. Grace is the power to stop sinning. Grace is not just God forgiving us of our sin. It's not merely a cover for our sin. It empowers us to defeat sin. Let me put it to you this way. Tim Keller put it to you this way. There is no sin that is a match for his grace. And I'm not talking about the sin of the past. I'm talking about sins of the future. You see, you, see, you don't have to keep sinning. You don't have to keep swearing. You don't have to keep giving in to sexual sin. You don't have to keep on getting addicted or, or lying or gossiping or cheating. You don't have to keep getting drunk and getting high and carousing around. You don't have to keep giving in to temptation. I need some ex-sinners to testify in this place. I used to get drunk, but now I don't. I used to get high, but now I don't. I used to commit sexual sin, but now I don't. I used to be a liar, but now I don't lie anymore. I used to be a thief, but now I don't steal. I used to gossip and tear down, but I don't do that anymore. Does anybody want to testify? That the power of the cross sets me free. See, at the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin over your life. And he destroyed his control over you. And as a result, you now have victory over sin. I know this is new thinking for some of you because this is not what our culture teaches us. This is not what American Christianity teaches us, but this is what the Bible teaches us, is that sin does not have power over you any longer. You are no longer a slave to sin. Jesus told us that we can have victory over sin. He said, if you want to be my disciple, here's how you do it. You got to take up your cross and you got to follow me. What he is saying is, you got to kill sin in your life. I got to kill it. All right, how do I kill sin? Write this down. I got to crucify it. See, what Jesus did on the cross for sin is the same thing that we should do to sin. We got to nail it to the cross. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. See that nail that you're going to receive today is not only going to remind you that your sin killed Jesus, but it's also going to remind you how you need to treat the sin in your life. You got to kill it you got to destroy it. I don't compromise with it. I don't negotiate with sin. I don't accommodate sin. I don't live with sin. I crucify it. I put it to death. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I might need to cut off some relationships. I might need to eliminate some subscriptions. I might need to stop watching a certain show. I might need to take a different route to work. I might need to get a new cell phone number. And I might need, even de need to trade in my smartphone for an old flip phone. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to tell you what John Owen said. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Pastor, 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 pastor. I, 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 I thought if I just prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior, I'm in like Flynn. Listen, it begins with a confession of faith and a decision to turn your heart. But I'm going to tell you, now that you have decided to follow Jesus, you have decided to follow a man who was crucified. And his crucifixion is a picture of what you and I need to do about the sin in our lives. I heard a man who was praying with his pastor at the altar. He prayed a prayer that the pastor had heard him pray many times before. The man was praying, Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. And just as he said this, the pastor interrupted and said, no, kill the spider, Lord. Some of you have to think about that. All right, so if I'm going to kill sin in my life, 
I've got to crucify it. So how do I crucify it? Are you ready for this? I've got to confess it to God. And then Jane, uh, it should be James, chapter 5 and 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Listen, this is why we do groups at our church, why we challenge everybody, attend Sunday morning consistently, join a group, serve on a team. Listen, the reason we want you to join a group is we want you to build relationships with people. God never called us to do this thing by ourselves. Matter of fact, we need each other to have victory. Come on, somebody. And see, here's the deal. I go to my group, whatever that is, if it's a Bible study group or a running group or whatever your group is, but you build relationships over time. And listen, it doesn't happen the first, the first time. Over time, you build these relationships, you can take the mask off and get real. This is my struggle. This is my issue. This, this is what I was dealing with. This is, this is where, this is where I'm, I'm being tempted to compromise. Come on, somebody. You see, when I, when I bring it out of the darkness into the light, it dies. It's our secrets that keep us sick, somebody said. So when I confess it, not to everybody, please don't go on Facebook today and, and just share. Every, please don't do that. Please, please, please don't do that. But everybody needs somebody that we can take the mask off with and, them, and they can hold us accountable for our lives. Am, am, I, am I preaching good here today? I may have to amen myself all day. See, if you're the only one who knows your secrets, you're in trouble. So if we're going to crucify it, we got to confess it. And then we got to take it one step further. I'm not just going to confess it. I'm going to repent from it. Now, the word repent kind of has gotten a bad connotation uh, in, in the past. But, but I like the way Acts 3.19 says, Paul, Peter's on the day of Pentecost, he says, repent then. And he says, and turn back. And see, and that's the picture of repentance. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry, God, or I'm sorry for what I've done. Repentant means now I'm actually going to take a different direction. I'm, I'm going to stop walking the way I'm walking, and I'm going to go somewhere else. Are, are you with me here today? It's not, just about, uh, uh, it's not just about eliminating sin from my life, but it's about replacing it with something better. I'm almost done. Right? What, what, what do I, if, if I've, and, and this is probably a new way for most of us to think about repentance because when we say repent, I got to stop doing this. I got to stop saying this. I got to stop going here. I got to stop acting this way. Well, you, it's going to be very hard for you just to stop unless you replace it with something else. That's repentance. And that means I replace it with the Word of God. Because Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin. There's something about God's word that keeps me from sin. God's word is bread. It's, it's hope. It's life. It's power in my life. Somebody used to say that sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. You see, you don't just read the Bible. You don't just read the one-year Bible. You don't just do that just because, well, everybody at church is doing it. Pastor Wayne says I got to read my Bible. No, you got to understand when I'm reading this book and I'm hiding it in my heart, it's keeping me from sin. There's a power in it. There is a grace in it. That helps me to overcome sin. And this is also helps us to keep from sinning is the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. I tried to use my movie voice. That didn't work. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. It didn't work at that time either. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Watch this. The Spirit puts to death the sins of your life. Watch this. The Holy Spirit in you is like that water that Dorothy poured on the wicked witch of the West in the Wizard of Oz. I'm melting. I'm melting. I've been waiting all week to do that for you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> See, when I, when I worship 
And I say, Holy Spirit, come fill my life. It's like water to my soul. And that water is destroying that witch, that sin, that junk. See, that's why I pray every day. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the power of the Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that will, the Bible says, it puts death to sin. Are you get, That's what it means to repent. Repent doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing something. It means I want to do something else that's going to replace it, and now I'm going to have power to overcome it. We're going to take communion here in just a moment, and we're going to reflect on the cross. But before we do, I want to show you a video that's a pretty graphic, and, and, and when I say graphic, I don't mean that anything you're going to see is, you know, is inappropriate. That's not what I'm saying. But it's a very, it's a very uh, strong, is the word, strong picture of what you and I should do to our sin. Watch this.
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And would you take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about this message today? Holy Spirit, speak to me about my life. Speak to me about the cross. Holy Spirit, remind me again of the grace and the kindness of God. I was lost. I was hopeless. It was my sin that killed your son. And if you've never prayed a prayer like this today, I want you to pray out loud a prayer of faith and surrender to Jesus Christ. If you're ready to say, Pastor, I'm, I'm not serving the Lord. I, I'm not following Jesus. I've been playing a game, really. I haven't taken sin seriously, that's for sure. But today I recognize that sin is deadly. Sin is serious. Jesus is the only one that could have paid that penalty, and he did it for me. And I'm going to receive that gift today. I can't earn it because all of my righteousness, my good deeds are like filthy rags. It's dirty. But I thank you for the cross. And today I'm ready to surrender my heart and life to Jesus. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? And everybody that would like to pray with them, would you say, Dear God, I agree with you. I've sinned. I'm guilty. I'm sorry. You died for my sin. Thank you for that. You're my only hope. My faith is in you. Your death, your resurrection. I receive Jesus as my Savior, and I surrender to him as my Lord. From this day forward, I'm following you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if that's you and, and you've prayed that for the first time or for the first time in a long time, when this service is over, I want you to go to the information tent and just let them know, hey, I prayed to receive Christ. They're going to give you a Bible. They're going to encourage you and pray with you because we're now on this journey of this crosswalk together following Jesus. And you want to talk to them about getting baptized. That is, that's what water baptism is, symbolically being buried in death with Jesus and raising up to new life. Baptism doesn't save us. It's a picture of what has already happened just now, actually, when I say I'm dead to sin and now I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Anybody want to testify that you were dead to sin and now you're alive through Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. I want you to take the bread and the cup in your hand, and if somebody could bring me one, I would appreciate it. Thank you. This is why, this is why Jesus instituted the practice of communion. It's not just another religious activity. I want you to look up here and, and see the reason Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, when you come to the Lord's Supper, which is what this is, or communion, he says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Here's what he's saying. Paul is saying, the purpose of this is, and he says, do it as off, he said, do it often. He didn't, he didn't say every day, he didn't say every week. He just said, do it often. He says, the reason is, we got to examine our hearts often. I got to examine my relationship with God. And I got to pray prayers like David prayed in Psalms. Search me, O oh God. Search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me, any pride, any sin. Forgive me. And the Bible says if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the purpose of communion. So before we receive the bread, receive the cup, would you take a moment and just examine your life? 
And if the Holy Spirit brings something to mind, would you take a moment and confess it? Lord, I agree with you. That's sin. Right where you're at. Steve, I don't know if you have a chorus that you could sing lightly and softly, but everybody just take a moment. Talk to the Holy Spirit. Examine me, God. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. And there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, it's flow. And at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. And where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe Lord, we thank you for the bread, the body of Jesus that bore our sin, suffered because of our sin. I thank you, God, for taking my sin on yourself. What an amazing gift, amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for it. Receive the bread together. Lord, we thank you for this cup representing the grace of God. Not grace, just grace to forgive, but grace to overcome. Lord, we receive this cup in remembrance that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have broken the power of sin over our lives, and we are no longer slaves to that sin. As we receive this cup, God, we receive your strength. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and let the water of your spirit just flood our soul. And God, destroy every sin. As we receive your cup, God, we thank you for victory over sin. In Jesus' name, receive together. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, God. We just got to sing it, don't we? Got to sing Amazing Grace. Before we sing it, are you glad you came to church today to hear about sin? Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like best praise from all the ex-sinners in the house have been saved by the amazing grace of God. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Amen.